Now I want to talk about some of the things that people commonly get wrong when building a QMX. And this comes from experience of us assembling QMX radios here at QRP Labs and the mistakes that some of my team make, as well as the experience of people reporting on the QRP Labs forum over the last couple of months. Before you start anything, make sure that you read the instruction manual and at least several times the instruction manual has a lot of useful information and one of the biggest risks and the biggest mistakes people make is not reading the instruction manual carefully. And it often comes about that somebody who has very little experience at kit building can actually build it more successfully than someone has a lot of experience at kit building. And the reason for that is the person with a lot of experience will start skipping sections in the manual or not reading them carefully enough, whereas a new person will read every single word and take it slowly. Timing is so important. Make sure that you select a time when you have peace and quiet, uh, you're not too tired, you're sober, you make sure that you haven't just had an argument with the XYL and you're still annoyed about it. Uh, make sure it's quiet and there's nobody to talk to. This is a problem that we have a lot here because there are several people all working together. Uh, they end up talking and losing concentration and that leads to mistakes which are time consuming to fix later. So timing is important and uh, selecting the right environment with well lit and if possible a nice clean workbench where you can see where things are and uh, not knock things around and loose things. Some of my worst mistakes have been when I've tried to continue uh, with a difficult construction project for longer than I should have done when I was already tired because I wanted to get it finished. So it's definitely worth breaking the project up into smaller pieces and uh, doing it over several evenings rather than trying to finish it all at once and risk making a mistake. So get yourself one of these. Um, I actually have two because I keep losing them all over the bench. So it's very good to have one handy. Um, and then you can really do very close inspections of every joint as you've done the joint. Um, and, and look for any kind of discoloration that would indicate a dry joint. Look for any kind of bubbling that might indicate that you've got solder on the component lead but it hasn't adhered to the board. Um, this is very, very important to do on this board, particularly, as I said, because it's a six-layer board. One thing to check as soon as you've got your board is that there's no damage to this electrolytic capacitor or either one of these three 330 micro Henry inductors in the power supplies. We have seen quite a few cases where these have been broken and it seems that they're really quite delicate components and because they're protruding up from the board, they're particularly vulnerable to damage. So what I would recommend is check for that first. If you find one of these inductors has cracked, um, or indeed any of the inductors in the, in the cores in the kit, the powdered iron uh, T30 cores or the ferrites, Bear in mind that as long as it's in a small number of pieces, you can just super glue that back together, uh, which is called crazy glue in some places and uh, CA glue in some places, um, or any kind of glue. Remember that all these uh, ferrite cores are really just a bunch of rusty iron stuck together in ceramic and molded into a shape. And it doesn't matter at all if you've got glue in there instead of ceramic. It will still behave exactly the same. So if you find that one of these are snapped but the wires are still attached, you can easily just glue it down again and it will be, it'll work perfectly well. Um, but do check those before starting because uh, they are, as I said, quite vulnerable. We actually improved our packing um, as we learned that sometimes in shipping these came off. When you first look at the board, uh, the first thing to note is that in about half the board's uh, because they're made on a, a two by one panel, there's a construction rail down each side. We will have removed the one on the right hand side of the two in order to access the USB C connector during testing. But if it's the board on the left, that's a 50% chance, and it will have this rail here, which we've left here to make it more secure during transport. So if you've got a board like that, the first thing to do is get some pliers and just very gently uh, prise that off. There's no need to saw it, there's no need to score it. 
there's no need for any fuss it just snaps off um, carefully that easily without damaging anything the next thing to do is to break the boards into pieces and I like to use a pair of uh, rather blunt wire cutters for that and uh, keep the sharp ones for later and just my favorite way of doing that for each tab that you have to snap just grab it and twist it like that until it breaks off and that way you're not putting any pressure on any of the components when you break apart the board into its very various pieces um, remember to break off these tabs as well and don't lose those because you need those as spacers later to space the control board but you need to file off these rough edges now some of the edges are much more important to file off flat than others so for example all these edges on the outside of the controls board need to really be really be filed down well as do these edges here because this control board later has to fit through that hole when you're assembling the radio into its enclosure. So it's very important to file those down properly. Filing down these edges at the edge of the display board is also important because it has to slide into the rails in the enclosure. The others are a little bit less important um, and uh, it won't matter too much because there's some clearance between there and the edge of the board anyway. Some people had expressed a worry about filing the boards too much and had said that um, on some boards that they had experience of previously where there were power planes inside the board, if you filed down the edge of the board you could create shorts between ground planes and power planes. Do not worry about that in the case of QMX for at least two reasons. The first is that the ground planes start some distance back from the edge of the board and so there are no, there's no copper near the edge of the board anyway. But even if you did file in far enough that you would come to copper, um, or as can happen in these tabs, for example, um, it's still all ground plane. All six layers in the QMX are all ground plane. There is no solid power plane. There is one plane where most of the power rails are rooted, but they are not anywhere near the edge of the board, and there's no general power plane across the entire board. So there's no possibility of shorting anything by filing too rigorously at the board edges. You don't need to worry about that. You should try to file these edges of the boards at the end particularly well and the reason for that is when it comes to be installed in the enclosure you really need it to sit snugly. The enclosure is exactly the same width of the board and if the board has some kind of protrusion as a v-shaped protrusion where you've snapped it off that will prevent the end panels of the enclosure from sitting on the board properly. The first thing to do um, if you've got a revision one board which at the moment everybody does is check to see that you don't have the short on the 5 volt power supply and to do this you need a DVM in continuity mode or if you don't have a continuity mode you can put it in the lowest uh, resistance meter mode uh, this one has a DVM mode with a nice convenient click on it if there's a short so all of the QMX boards that are shipped from about around about late August onwards have already been checked and tested and resolved if necessary but boards that were shipped before that could have this short we don't really know the percentage it's somewhere between probably 10 and 30 percent of boards that have this short on the power supply board now it's definitely easiest to solve this short before you assemble the board because once you've assembled the board uh, with the pin headers on it it'll be much harder to resolve so to check for the short you look at this, uh, the right hand of the two large P-channel MOSFETs and you just hold one of the probes on its tab and the other on this pin here. Now you can see here in this example I do have the short. The short exists between the drain of this small transistor here which is Q104 and the drain tab of the large transistor here which is Q103. It actually occurs because they're a little bit too close together and just depending randomly where this larger of the transistors happens to sit it's, it's rather close and you can develop a solder bridge between the two. I have a low cost uh, SMD rework station and uh, I use the hot air mode for clearing the short so I have just a large board 
here unused board that I use just to keep my workbench from burning up and I just mounted a screw on it that easily fits over that hole on the SMD board. Now I put this on the maximum temperature which on my unit is 360 degrees centigrade. Don't use the maximum um, airflow because if you do that you can end up blowing apart other components nearby. So I just hold this about the centimetre above the large transistor here and keep it running for about 10-15 seconds. Um, and then what happens is you can actually see the uh, you can actually see the it's a little bit hard to do this while videoing but you can actually see when the solar starts to melt. Things change colour and start to bubble and look liquidy. And you can just give them a slight nudge. That should be enough to resolve the short. And as soon as it cools down a bit, everything will solidify. Now I can just uh, check that again, and you see I've got no beeping. It's resolved. Let's see that took less than a minute. Now if you didn't listen to me and you actually went ahead and uh, continued with the assembly and powered up, what you would probably have done is blown this 1N4148 diode here uh, near the connector of the board. Now that's not terribly hard to replace and it doesn't have to be a 1N4148 and actually you can even just replace it with a through hole component, it doesn't have to be an SMD component. If you needed to replace it with a through hole 1N4148, you can connect one end of the 1N4148 quite easily to the, to the drain of this transistor here and the other end to one this leg of the uh, resistor here. That might be easier than replacing the SMD component and you probably already have them in your junk box. It'll work just as well and the exact model of the diode isn't important at all. If you want to resolve this and you don't happen to have a hot air gun, then I would suggest that it would be easier um, lifting up the pins of the smaller of the transistors here, um, which is Q104. Um, just lift up with a knife while heating those, those two, maybe add on some extra solder uh, before attempting to lift them, and then just move that very slightly away from the large transistor here. So I think it can still be done even without a hot air gun, but a hot air gun definitely makes it very easily. Now one thing that causes people some concern is the USB-C connector here. Now I actually chose a high performance USB-C connector from DigiKey with through hole, play, through hole pins rather than SMD pads because I thought that it would help having the extra uh, physical strength for a component which is at the outside and which is going to occasionally get some physical stress on it. So I preferred to have these through hole pins as I thought that it would be stronger. Unfortunately it seems to give some challenge to the SMD factory when they install it and the holes don't seem to be very very full of solder. So there's an instructional step in the manual where it recommends uh, just touching up these joints and adding some extra solder to them. Don't go overboard with panic about it. It does look empty, but remember that all the boards have been tested here before we ship them, and part of our testing is that we check for USB connectivity on the connector. So it's a good idea and a good precaution to touch up the solder joints just in case they're a little bit light or could later come loose or something like that. But it's not something to just immediately panic when you think that the holes are completely empty because they have all got connectivity through from the other side. Um, but it's just a recommended step to make sure that uh, you've just uh, taken all possible precautions. Now some common mistakes people make uh, when building the QMX. The first thing to note is that by far the most common mistake people make is not properly burning off the enamel from these toroids and that will result in no power output or in the case of the receiver 
trifilar toroid here and the bandpass filter here, it'll resolve in, it result in no receive uh, signals at all. And so that's something that's very important to work out. There are two ways to remove the enamel from the thinner of the wires that's used on these uh, low-pass filter toroids and the bandpass filter toroid. This is, you can either remove it by burning off the enamel, it has a type of enamel on it which has quite a low burning temperature, or you can use it by you can do it mechanically with sandpaper or by scraping it with a knife. The larger wire, which is used on the choke here and on the output transformer and on the two main wires here through the SWR bridge, the larger transformer wire really needs to be uh, scraped mechanically, either with a knife or with a wire cutter gently, um, or with sandpaper. You can't really burn that off. The type of enamel doesn't burn off. But it's a very good idea, I think, to, once you've uh, soldered on these, in each particular location, you need to just check across with the DVM in continuity mode, making sure that you actually touch it on the on the pads uh, rather, rather than anywhere else. Do not be tempted to tin the uh, copper of these wires, uh, the thick wires particularly. If you tin the copper, they will not fit in the holes. So just scrape off the enamel uh, or sand it off or um, whatever you're going to do to it and then put the bare copper into the hole before soldering it. Add no solder before, before that. Later, when it comes to the output power, you may find you have a little bit less power than you want on some bands. We often find that these three toroids, so remember that this pair of toroids is for 20, 30 meters, this pair of toroids is for 40 and 60 meters, and this pair of meter, uh, toroids is for 80 meters. We often find that these three toroids on the electrically nearest to the antenna, if you increase the, the inductance on these by squeezing the turns together, uh, you actually improve the power up. But um, it's not that easy to do on here because there's so little space, but nevertheless, it is, it is possible to make some improvement uh, if you notice low power output. Generally speaking, it's not worth uh, going after every last fraction of a watt. It makes very, very little difference to the received signal strength at the other end um, half a dB or a dB is not going to make very much difference to anybody. Another common mistake that people make is that they don't apply enough heat. Now this is a six layer board and two of those layers are pure ground plane. Even the other four layers which have signals and tracks on them, there's an awful lot of ground plane and even though we use thermals, uh, which is the name in PCB design language for when you don't connect the entire circumference of a hole to the ground plane, you have just four little connections at 90, 180, 270 and 0 degrees. And so that reduces the amount of heat which is dissipated away. Even though we do that, the fact that you've got six layers means that if you've got ground connections, they're going to really, really suck the heat away very, very strongly. And so Particularly when you solder, for example, the ground connections of capacitors, you really, really do need to hold the soldering iron quite firm, firmly between the component lead and the board and make sure that you apply a lot of heat. For this reason, I also recommend using a 60 watt iron at least. Um, the temperature is not as important as the capacity of the iron, and if you use a very, very thin pointed tip, that's also going to make it harder because you just won't be able to get enough heat energy out of the iron quickly enough into the joint. So bear all of this in mind and I also really recommend an inspection with a loop just after you've done each joint. The inductors here, the 47 microhenry inductors, uh, you do need to handle them sometimes with a bit of care. I have seen situations where the inductors have gone open circuit because of uh, open, uh, bending them backwards and forwards too many times. I've also seen cases where people have mixed up the capacitors, got the wrong value capacitors in the, right, in the wrong places. Remember that the blue and yellow capacitors are just based on what we can get supply of from DigiKey. Sometimes we'll get the yellow 
Vichet ones and sometimes we'll get the blue TDK ones. Um, the Vichet ones are preferred because they sit more tidily and small, but we can't even get we can't always get those. Um, so don't rely on the colours being the same in the manual. Make sure you read the values on the capacitor itself. Even though it's very hard to read, but again, that's where your uh, trusty loop comes in, and with that you'll be able to see everything in the right light. And the next thing to note is that the original instructions had actually got the two uh, capacitors here and here in the 20 meter low pass filter swapped and so that resulted in a somewhat something of a reduction in power output on 20 meters. Now it's quite hard to get those capacitors out and then to put them back in the other way. What I did on mine was just put them back in tagged tap, tapped onto the bottom of the board um, and that works just as well. The other issue with the early version of the instructions was that there was quite a low sensitivity on 20 meters and this was caused by a parasitic resonance in the bandpass filter here um, which had a notch somewhere just slightly above 20 meter band. This is quite a serious problem. So the resolution to that was described on a web page on the QRP Labs website and can be easily done if you've built it the, the other way. Um, you can, if you read the current assembly manual, it already incorporates this modification, so you don't need to do anything except just follow the manual. Mine is a bit messed up here because this was the board that I used for various testing. When it comes to L401, the bandpass filter inductor, the best way to wind this is that the first winding, the 19 turns winding, goes around here. And then when you continue winding until you get to 28 turns, put it into this last hole, this 80 meter hole, and then pass it through the board, and then on the other underside of the board, come back over to the 40 meter hole, and make sure that it's soldered electrically connected to both of these two holes, and again, check it with the DVM in continuity mode. Remember that when it comes to trifilla transformer, uh, you have to get all of the windings correct and you should again measure those with the DVM before the installation. If you mix up those windings, what will happen is that you will not get good image rejection when you go into the um, uh, terminal applications and you run the image sweep tool. And it will be very, very clear. So for example, you might see 30 dB of image rejection or 40 or 50 and all of that would be fine depending on component tolerances and winding styles of the inductor and so on, the transformer, um, but if you saw 5 or 4 dB or something of image rejection or none at all that would indicate that you'd mixed up the windings here and something was wrong. So refer to all of the sweeps in the manual and you should have something that's within a few dB of what's shown in the manual. Um, it's well worth opening the terminal applications and logging in on the terminal to be able to see those and run the diagnostic tools. Another common fault I've seen uh, reasonably often is getting the diodes the wrong way around. And people get mixed up between the orientation of the diode, as in which end is the white stripe and where is it going, and the orientation of the lead with respect to the body. In the, di in the diagram in the manual it is quite clear but still it's something that can cause confusion and the direction of the body where the body is located compared to the lead is arranged such that there's maximum space for these toroids because it's all quite a tight fit but electrically the most important thing is that the white stripe is in the correct hole in the correct orientation. If you have that the wrong way round it's very hard to find the problem um, because you will find you do get power output, you do get received signals, but what happens is the power output is less than it should be because you've got RF interfering with each other across the low-pass filters rather than cleanly switching on one of the three, and you'll also get bad RF filter plots and attenuation on the filters. So it's very important to get those the correct way around, and it's something I've seen quite a lot. Now, QMX is a very, very compact design, and when building the QMX, you need to be very careful not to damage any of these SMD components, which are already installed on the board. So, when uh, soldering a component, for example, if I want to solder the BS170 
output transistors here, it's very important to come in with the soldering iron from a direction where there are not any SMD components underneath. For example, here's a very small SMD component on this side. If I was to come in from, from, the, from this side, I would risk damaging that SMD resistor there. So always look to see where there are other resistors and capacitors nearby and make sure that you come in from the opposite direction when doing the soldering as a joint. Similarly, when you come to cut the offcuts of the, of the wires, bring the uh, wire cutter in again from a direction where there are no SMD components. It's very easy if coming in if you've got SMD components underneath and when you cut and you pull a bit or you don't keep it quite horizontal, it's very easy to crunch one of the SMD components underneath it. It's not, a, it's not going to forgive you. If you crunch any component, something will not work or the whole thing will not work at all. So it's very important to try not to avoid, to, to try to avoid any kind of damage. Also trying to keep the uh, wire cutters ho blades horizontal and when you do the cut make sure you only squeeze to do the cut, don't pull. As soon as you start pulling and looking for leverage from the board that's when you can start scratching the board or crunching any SMD components which are nearby. Now next thing over here near the power connector on the revision 1 board this uh, plus 12 volt pin from the power connector is very close to one of the pins of the SMPS here. There's a very small clearance between those two, so make sure that you didn't apply any solder bridge between the two. There are a lot of other places where there's very little clearance between pads, uh, such as here on the, on the uh, 3.5 millimeter jack connectors. Now when you come to do the controls board, um, an ex additional pitfall here um, particularly on the early revisions of the board is that these uh, pins here are very hard to solder near to the edge of the board and you have a risk of having a, a lump of solder that, that shorts from the pin to the body, the metal body of the rotary encoder. Now one of these pins is ground anyway, that one's going to be particularly hard to solder because you've got a small area to put the soldering iron in and as I said just now the six layer board is going to suck the heat away really crazily. So that's very hard to solder those pins. Um, in subsequent revisions of the PCB I'm, I'm intending to try to make that easier to do but right now you need quite a lot of heat and firm, a firm application to be able, and some time to be able to solder those pins well. When you solder the other pin, the non-ground pin, uh, do make sure that you don't accidentally get a short in between the body of the rotary encoder which will be grounded quite likely if, if there's a connection somewhere else or if the uh, body touches the enclosure which is quite likely to also be grounded. Um, so really be careful when soldering these. Um, the other ones a little bit further away from the body so um, that does make those a bit easier but that's still the case. Um, if you had powered this thing up and you find that it comes on before you press the on off button on the left here or if you find that you can't turn it off by pressing the on off button here then it's probably a case that you've got a short. Similarly if you find that none of the buttons work um, and you, you can't really figure out why then again check, check for a, a short here or sometimes um, the ground pin has not properly been soldered to the pad. I've seen that quite a few times too. Now when you follow the instructions, the instructions um, explain that these pin headers are quite a bit longer uh, than the top of the board and you need to cut off the pin headers. These pin headers are extremely hard to cut with wire cutters and require some force. If you come in with blunt wire cutters and you try and scrunch these like that then quite likely you can lift the pads from the boards or you can do all sorts of other things. You should wear eye protection or close your eyes or put a finger inside between um, your eyes when you're cutting just to, like, like that just to make sure that the pieces don't fly off into your eyes. Another trick is it, do not try to cut them square um, with because the, they're a square, square bodied uh, pin when you do the cutting, do not try to cut with the blades parallel to the squareness. Cut from a diagonal like that, and that makes it a lot easier to cut. Again, make sure that you cut with the, with the blade parallel to the board, and make sure that you squeeze the blade rather than pulling. Um, 
it really really is important that that blade is sharp rather than just some blunt old thing which will make it very much harder and also easier to damage the board. Next thing, alignment of the components is important, particularly the power supply boards. Remember that you do not want to solder the power supply boards so that these pins are all the way flat down on the board because they have to lift up a fraction of a millimetre um, from the board so that they can support this two or three millimetres gap here. Now, when fitting these plastic screws here, uh, it's recommended not to drill out the inner one of the two bolts. You might think at first that it would be better to drill out this bolt here in the middle. It's actually better to screw it in as far as there's a little bit protruding through to go into the hole and then put the top one on and hold it pressed while you then screw in the rest and that way you get perfect alignment between the two. If you drill or burn the hole out you never get these lining up so well um, with the perfect spacing and the perfect orientation. The other thing to remember is that in this corner there's going to be a 11 or 11 millimeter pillar between the two boards and that will get in the way of this nut. So when you tighten this nut the best thing to do is to put a little bit of pressure from the side push this way while push this way while tightening it so that it just fits in its hole away from uh, the place you're going to put it and keep your hand on there so that these flat parts are then facing where the where the pillar is going to be and that way it will all fit together nicely and you won't end up with something sticking out from the edge of the board which would stop the enclosure from going on properly. Pay attention to everything it says in the manual about how to orientate the power supply boards before soldering, then solder the top side, then remove them and solder the underside. That does give the best orientation. It's also important to get a good orientation on the other connectors between the boards, so there's quite some um, variation in positioning because the holes are bigger than the pins that you're putting in. So when you put them in, make sure that you try to get them as straight as possible relative to the edges of the board and the uh, connections they're going to go into. That applies to the 2x5 header here, the 2x4 header here, the 2x2 header over here and of course these connections here. Everything needs to be as square as possible to minimise the chance of any problems when you're trying to put it into the enclosure or fit the boards together. These 3.5mm jack connectors have a tendency to want to go in at an angle and so you need to try to push them quite hard to get them to be square, a square 90 degrees relative to the board. There's quite a lot of variation in how you can install the power connector so try to get it inside its white silk screen footprint on the board and with the front edge of this connector parallel to the edge of the board. A common question is should be we put heat sink compound underneath the faces of the transistors in order to reduce the thermal resistance to the circuit board. You can um, be careful that you've got a thermal paste which is not electrically conducting um, because if that seeps into other areas where it could cause short circuits that would be a problem. Um, it's not necessary and it's not going to make a lot of difference. These are not high power transistors with low thermal resistance between the actual silicon junction and the edge of the package. You can add thermal paste but it will make very little difference to the great total thermal resistance from the actual silicon in the middle to the edge of the to the edge of the device. It makes very little difference but there's no harm if you want to do it and it makes you feel better. Similarly bear in mind that this washer on the top is not the heat sink, the washer is just there to press the flats against the board. So a common mistake I've seen is installing the transistors, soldering them up, and then they're not at the right angle to be put flat down against the board. So I'd really recommend um, put the transistors in first without soldering and then tighten up this so that you can be sure that they're flattened against the board before doing the soldering. Because I have seen some cases where the transistors were not pushed flat against the board simply because it would require too much force to close that nut to cause that to happen. Don't worry if this transformer ferrite seems to uh, hang over the outside and don't worry about any other connections which seem close to the edge. There's actually, this board is, is quite a bit smaller than the uh, display board that goes into the enclosure rails and there's some clearance between the edge of the board here and the enclosure, so there's no problem with that.
There's a spot here in the power amplifier for two Zener diodes, and this comes from a discussion on the forum about adding 47 volt or 56 volt Zener diodes across the drains of the power transistors in order to protect them. Um, it's still not completely resolved whether that's a good idea or not. It needs more testing. The pads are there on the board, and the Zener diodes are there in the schematic, but they're not part of the build. So when you see that those are empty, don't worry about it. When it comes to tightening this uh, bolt here for the uh, power transistors, please be careful not to over tighten it because in the revision one board there is actually a 5 volt trace running underneath this um, bolt head here. So you, if you really scraped it hard and um, scraped the enamel off the board you could actually short the 5 volt rail to ground there. I haven't seen any instances of that happening, um, but it's something that I worried about, and so I will remove that in the future PCB revision. Now, it's very difficult to install this BNC connector so that it's at a 90 degree angle to the board in all directions, and it will want to sit down on its legs here against the board. It will want to sit down uh, and there's about a millimeter you need about a millimeter of gap there if you have the rear legs sitting down flat against the board as they want to then the uh, socket will slant upwards slightly like that so one way to arrange this is to actually bolt on the enclosure panel so that you can have a reference and can see how how uh, close to 90 degrees you can get it i do it by soldering the middle pin first and not the outside pins just solder the middle pin and then when you're happy with the orientation add a tiny bit of solder to another of the ground pins and then uh, check again and keep checking and then add more and more solder if you get this wrong these bnc connectors are extremely difficult to remove afterwards because not only is it heavy amount of metal mass but it's also as i mentioned a six layer circuit board which is going to drain away the heat so it's really difficult to remove those afterwards if you do have to remove it, the best thing to do would be actually to just try and cut it and get a new one and then take pieces out one by one. Do not forget the, the step in the manual about bending this tab flat onto the LCD. And when you do bend it, be careful about bending it so that you try to still keep these tabs tight. Remember that these tabs are actually pulling together the sandwich of materials that make up this LCD module and they indeed you need to keep tension on them. So try to remember that when you're, when you're bending this over. Um, we haven't heard of any problems of people having any problems with that and none of our team here have any pro had any problems with that step. The only problems have come when, as you can see in this particular example, if somebody forgot to do that, then what happens is as that closes it interferes with this inductor and will snap off the top of the inductor. If that does happen to you then remember that as long as the wires are there and the, there's continuity through that inductor that tiny bit of ferrite chipped off the top is not going to make hardly any difference so don't worry about that but you could snap it off completely so it's very important not to forget that step. The other important thing on the LCD mounting is these uh, pins along the back here you'll put wires through from the other side you need to trim those quite tight because some of them are close to components on the main board um, when it's all sandwiched up together so make sure that you don't leave long leads there and, and keep them quite tight there have been questions about how to wind the SWR transformer and whether it matters what sense the winding is in um, the jury is still slightly still out on that one but I would say that it probably is important to get the windings in the right sense and if you follow the manual the way it's done in the manual which will always also be the common sense way that it feels right to do it then you'll find you won't have any problem I've also seen a few cases of people simply forgetting to install things or forgetting to solder things um, people who have built the QCX Mini before will know that it has a similar 2x5 pin header on the left hand side of the display but on the QMX there's also a 2x2 pin header, header here on the right hand side of the display. I've seen cases where people have forgotten to install that. I've seen cases where people have sometimes forgotten to solder the pins on the connectors. For example, maybe they soldered one pin just to sol hold it in place square and they were going to solder the others, but then they forgot to go back and do it. I've seen cases like that. 
I've seen cases where people have forgotten to solder the ground pins of the BNC connector. Um, also check for shorts between the centre pin and either of these outside ground pins here because that's another thing that can happen. I've also seen quite a few times uh, cases where people have soldered the top side of the connectors on the power supply boards but they've forgotten completely to solder the bottom and solder the connections on the other side so they'd have to un open everything up and solder the other side and that's steps in the instructions but it's something you can't see so you can't see whether you've done it or not and I suppose it's easy to forget um, but there's no damage going to occur it's just not going to power up anything. Now remember to check everything again visually um, before you even think about applying power to the board. Um, it's very important to check for any sh shorts and solder whiskers. It will save you a lot of time later if you spend a minute or two now just going over the whole board in great detail and seeing what you can find. Another way to do it is take a good photograph on your smartphone and then blow the photograph up on a larger screen or zoom in on it and then you can see a lot of detail too. So that's another way to do it. When you have a look over the board for um, any solder shorts or solder whiskers it's also worth checking to make sure that no SMD components are missing uh, have been inadvertently knocked off um, it'll be much easier if you can notice that and fix that than trying to find it later it's also worth using the uh, DVM again in continuity mode just to make some checks. Check between the VCC, the 5 volt pin, and the ground pin of the chip, for example, to make sure there's no short on the 5 volt rail. And again, it's worth checking on the 3.3 volt rail as well just to make sure that there's no shorts um, anywhere, direct shorts, because that would cause problems. When it comes to installation in the enclosure, remember that. These screws should go in very, very easily. Um, there shouldn't. If you if you're needing to push hard to put these screws in, then you're pushing them in at an angle. Uh, but if they're properly in in place, they should go in very easily, and you should be able to tighten them nicely. So no need to force anything. When you come to put on these. Uh, knobs you need to make sure that there's a small gap underneath each knob uh, maybe a millimeter or so because you need to be able to press those knobs this is the power knob on the left and band change and mode change and the tune knob on the right and tune rate and various other functions on the right so remember to leave a small gap there between them when uh, putting the nut on the BNC connector it's not necessary to put the washer on I actually prefer to leave the washer off because I think it looks neater and I don't think it does much use useful function so I prefer to leave that washer off but it's a matter of personal preference so I think that's all I can think of uh, for the most common construction mistakes and things to watch out for uh, at the moment no doubt some of you who have built the QMX will have your own stories to tell to add to this, um, which no doubt will also coincide with the particular experience that you had. Um, as I said at the beginning, these experiences we built up here from having built um, something like 60 or 70 QMXs here at QRP Labs with my team and seeing what kind of common mistakes they made during the assembly. Um, so hopefully this has been helpful and good luck with the assembly. Um, it's a very nice radio when it works in the end.